The um, next conversation is wonderfully counterintuitive. It's uh, can't we leave it to the AT&Ts and Googles of this world? And um, I think it's wonderful that Jonathan Capel is the moderator of this because he's wonderfully counterintuitive. He lives in Arizona, and I discovered last night that he hates palm trees. And he's going to cut one down at his first opportunity in his own yard. Uh, <laughs> John, and I'm going to help him if I can. But anyway, Jonathan is uh, Dean of the College of Public Programs and Director of the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University. His research concerns the design and administration of complex organizations, especially those at the intersection of politics and markets. And he has examined global governance organizations that promulgate international rules dealing with everything from whales to bicycles to derivatives. Jonathan. <laughs> Great, thank you, Joel. And so it's, uh, it's, my, uh, it's my pleasure in this session to facilitate a conversation with our guest, uh, Jim Sacconi, um, who's a senior executive vice president for external and legislative affairs at AT&T, uh, responsible for AT&T's public policy. Uh, I think a name that most people in this room are familiar with has been involved in information policy uh, for as long as I've been following the subject. Uh, previously served uh, in the White House under uh, George H.W. Bush um, as Deputy Chief of Staff and uh, under President, uh, President Reagan as well. Um, I should also mention Chair of the AT&T Foundation. Um, so what I was thinking uh, as the conversation was going on about the, the stakes for changes in internet governance. There was a lot of discussion of how this affects governments. Um, there was a lot of uh, discussion of how this might affect individual users and their freedom and so on, all of which are important matters. But it struck me that there was very little discussion in that conversation, at least, what's at stake for businesses, um, American businesses, businesses in other parts of the world. So when AT&T looks at this question of what the governance of the future internet governance looks like, What's it worried about? What's it? What's uh, its? Well, many of the same things that the that the earlier panel uh, uh, talked about. I had I had to ha kind of contain myself when Andrew was speaking. I wanted to get up and cheer. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he said a lot of things. I I, uh, I was thinking that I thought would be impolitic to say, but um, uh, I I think I, I think companies are are, uh, are 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 in different places depending on where they uh, uh, where they are in their own transitions, uh, especially in the communications industry. Uh, I, I think in this country we have a remarkable alignment of positions uh, uh, between the industry, frankly, between the advocacy groups, between uh, 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 with the administration. I think everybody is is pretty much in the same place, and it's a, it's a place I think that that. Uh, uh, that, that was outlined earlier. I, I, we, you know, I think it's been summarized by Ambassador Kennard, uh, who's former FCC chairman, uh, who's now our ambassador to the EU, and he, he basically said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and uh, Dealey Crows, uh, uh, representing uh, the EU itself, uh, echoed uh, pretty much the same stance on the part of the EU. Um, what's interesting to me is, of course, you don't have a similar alignment between the, the communications industry in Europe and the governments in Europe, uh, uh, which is fascinating, actually. And I think the, uh, uh, the explanation for it is, is, is really that um, I, I think we're farther along in the broadband IP revolution in this country. It's a big transition. Uh, it's well underway. Um, and, uh, and, and we've been turning the corner on this. And we've had a lot of these wrenching debates. And, and I think, uh, in fact, I think the net neutrality debate was really an outgrowth of, of this transition. But five or six years ago, seven years ago, uh, uh, um, our company's primary business was selling minutes, which is what we'd done for 100 years. And, um, and increasingly, that is simply going away. And I think we had to confront the fact that on a going forward basis, our business was going to be selling bits, not minutes. And, and, um, and that leads to a host of changes. But if you think about that, it's a, it, it's, it's a remarkable and radical thing that companies as big as this, uh, that were once monopolies, in fact, could totally transform the core product they sell. And, uh, but but we've, we've turned that corner. We've done it. And, and frankly, it caused us to have to 
um, uh, uh, assess issues like net neutrality and and, uh, and 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 policies of openness, which which we've embraced uh, uh, throughout our network. Because at the core of it, if you're selling bits, you're you're pretty agnostic as to whether it's a voice bit or a video bit or a Skype bit or or something of this nature. Um, um, and in fact, uh, uh, your, your, your interest economically is, is in carrying the, the most traffic and, and uh, uh, be, because it's pretty simple that, that the, uh, in a high fixed cost business uh, like operating a network, uh, the more traffic you carry, the more money you make. And so, uh, so our interests in, have ended up very much aligned, I think, at this point uh, with, with the high tech community and, and with companies uh, like, uh, like Google, who Andrew used to work for. And, and, and we find ourselves actually partnering in this ecosystem now. Uh, uh, I don't think the European companies have turned that corner yet. Uh, and I think the Etno proposal um, is, is really a, almost a, a plea to move backwards to, into this more comfortable zone of, of, of a PSTN and PSTN regulation and PSTN means of compensation. Uh, uh, public switch telephone network, and uh, I thought I could get away with it because Andrew used it and got away with it. But but uh, but uh, um, <clears throat> and, and and so it's it's very difficult to move from 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 one you know uh, sort of ecosystem with with all the dependencies of that ecosystem, including including the regulators who are dependent on it and institutions like the ITU that subsist. Uh, 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 based on that, and and uh, um, and and I think in this country we've recognized the, the importance of replacing this this uh, this this old legacy telephone network and telephone regulatory network with with something more modern, more modern networks, IP broadband networks, and and frankly a more modern regulatory structure designed for those. And I uh, I think that I think the FCC is. Has begun to confront these things. I give I give Chairman uh, Janikowski a lot of credit for that. Uh, uh, you know, w we had the debate about whether we're going to have a subsidy system. You know, for universal this is a universal service fund, and uh, if we are going forward as opposed to looking backwards, what does it subsidize? And and he's he's drawn the the right and logical conclusion, which is we shouldn't keep subsidizing ad infinitum a copper line voice only network that's increasingly antiquated. It's going away. People are leaving it. Okay? And instead that subsidy system is gonna is gonna be geared toward the provision of broadband. And and everything is really moving that way. I don't think in Europe it's it's quite there yet. And I think the the, the communications companies there have put forward proposals which I think would be destructive of an IP broadband world and, and ecosystem. Um, and we've opposed those, uh, but the European governments themselves have opposed them. Uh, the European Parliament the other day put out a, a resolution opposing it. So, uh, um, uh, um, and and I think if you if you consider that, it's not hard then to understand how, in some of these developing countries where the government itself owns that legacy network and operates it, why they would be attracted to some of the ideas for for you know increasing regulation of the internet. So let, so let me push on that point a little bit because I think it's interesting. I, one thing that I find is that the conversation about what countries are looking for in an mm -hmm. IDO takeover of the internet, it's almost cartoonish in the sense it's like oh it's just authoritarian mm -hmm. regimes that want to repress their citizenry when it, it following from your observation a lot of it has to do with the underlying business model of the telecom providers in those countries and the connection between the regulator, the regulator, which is the state, mm -hmm. and the telecom provider, which is in many cases also the state. Right. So how is, how is the business model, if you will, in these countries and the regulatory power of the countries threatened by the status quo and what is the protection they're seeking? Right from a business point of view, well, I I think it was stated earlier. I can't remember who said it, but I, I you, you do have bad actors here. Okay, you do have authoritarian countries who simply who simply want to want, want control in this space uh, for purposes of repression, and um, um, uh, and then you have a, a a group of other countries that 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 may want control, maybe not for that purpose, but just have trouble abandoning the old model. Uh, I, I, I think, and I think it was said earlier, and I agree with it, that, that um, it, the danger is not that the ITU takes over the Internet. And, and uh, you know, that's not what AT&T is worried about. 
but, but we are worried that, that it does provide a legal underpinning for nation states being much more repressive, much more controlling uh, about the internet. And, 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 uh, and even authoritarian governments, I think, look for international legitimacy for their repressive actions, okay? It's, it's why in the old days, you know, co communist states named themselves democratic republics, okay? Because it, as if the word itself would, would, would make it so. But they, they looked for international legitimacy for their, for their policies. And I think it would be a, a shame and an embarrassment um, if the ITU provided that uh, to them. Um, I, I think for, for, for the great middle, as was, was mentioned earlier, the, of, of other countries who are, they're, they're, I think, in many cases having trouble getting their minds around this transition, much like Etno is having trouble getting its mind around it. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's happening so fast. I think the, uh, over the last decade, uh, internet uh, uh, penetration and usage in Africa is like double what it is in Asia. Uh, it's the fastest uh, in the world. And, and, uh, um, and if, you, if, if, if you're a nation state in Africa and you, you, you control what was, you know, previously, only, only a short years ago, the, the only monopoly communication system uh, in the nation, and then you find all of a sudden that now the, the increasingly the population is connected globally, you know, it, you know, it, it, it could worry you for any number of reasons, and, and uh, uh, not the least of which is that uh, how, do you, how do you continue supporting the, the legacy system uh, if, the, if the money is all draining away in the other direction? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I think, a, a global example of what we are dealing with at AT&T right now, which is, you know, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the 22 states where we have our wireline footprint, um, um, only 30% of homes are, are connected with a, with, with a, with a copper wired telephone. And that, and that number's continuing to decline. Of course, the costs of maintaining that network are continuing to increase. And, and so we're dealing, with, and that's one of the reasons we, we announced a, you know, a, a faster program of investment upgrade just two weeks ago. We put $14 billion over three years in, in modernizing and upgrading to IP as much of that uh, uh, base as, as possible. I mean, we're going to lose the customers otherwise, but, um, uh, you know, but, but, but in doing that, we have to, as we build a new network, be able to shut down the old network. Currently, under FCC rules, we're barred from turning off the old network. And so, if you think about that sort of dilemma, which we're working through with the FCC here, you multiply that across all these countries globally, you know, you could, I think, understand why some of them may be looking to the ITU to kind of slow things down. I want to immediately, I want to open things up right away and get people into the conversation. Sure. So I know Jim is interested to hear what people, what people want him to talk about. Um, <laughs> so, one, so one thing that, that so I've, I've studied a bunch of these different global organizations, including the ITU, and what always struck me as being the reality on the ground, notwithstanding what's written on paper, right? So there are these formal rules that say one country, one vote, and then there's how things really work, um, which bear a resemblance to the formal agreements, but they're certainly not um, accurately represented by them. I wonder, forget about this internet stuff. Just in the status quo, there's lots of other stuff that mm -hmm. AT&T is affected by that goes on in the ITU. Would, would AT&T as a corporation or the leadership of AT&T fear that this is an organization that actually might produce and finalize something that you felt was fundamentally destructive? That is to say that something could actually go through the process and be approved and be adopted that you would think of as being anathema. Um. I, I, well, I hope not. I, I, I think one has to approach these things at least, you know, w with care because I think the stakes, the stakes are high, and and uh, I think some of the proposals that are on the table from other countries, uh, uh, including in, including Russia, uh, um, are, are things that would be anathema, um, and and I don't think you can take for granted in a in a process where it's where it's one state one vote. Um, uh, that, that, that those don't get adopted. And so, uh, um, I, you know, I, I, think it, I think it's very important for us to, to be participating there, taking it seriously. The government is, the administration's been all over it. 
and, um, and, and I'm very hopeful coming out of this that we'll be able to persuade enough, enough other countries to, to reject these, these more radical notions, uh, which I think would be very destructive. Um, so. There's a couple of... Hi, <clears throat> David Johnson, New York Law School. Um, the discussion has conflated the regulation of the infrastructure with regulation of actions people take on the infrastructure. And on the latter point, I guess my question is, um, should we be afraid of the Democratic Republic of AT&T insofar as ISPs have the power uh, to ultimately disable uh, access by people who do things that violate whatever rules they establish and are not subject to the same kind of political feedback loops that uh, governments are. Mm -hmm. What assurance can you give us that it, if we get a cross ISP agreement on, you know, uh, six strikes or that kind of policy decision being made at the level of the infrastructure, yeah. that that will remain a kind of governance that is self-governance? Well, I, 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 I think you, you, have, you have protections at several levels. Number one, our economic self-interest uh, you know, would, would be damaged by doing that. Uh, number two, you know, you're, you're right, we could do it. We haven't, and we have a history of not ever you know, doing things of that nature. Uh, I think number three, in the example that you gave on, on copyright, we've been pretty vocal and public in saying we're, you know, we are not going to be you know, the content owner's enforcement agent. We're not, you know, we, we, we have no desire, no interest in, trying, in, in exercising some police power on behalf of, uh, of other claimants. I, I mean, if, if they go and, and get a court order, we'll comply with a court order. Um, but we're not going to cut people off. I mean, it's, it's forwarding notices from the content owners and, you know, uh, who allege copyright violations is, is a bit different. But, um, but we've, uh, we've been pretty clear that, that uh, we're not going to cut people off from the Internet without a court order. So um, I, you know, uh, and I, you know, and I think if we started acting in any other way, I think, I, I, I think we'd, we'd certainly be hearing from the Congress and the regulators pretty quickly. But, uh, but it's not in our self-interest to do that. And we've not done it. So, so what, so as a, as a political actor um, who knows the landscape, I'm curious to project out this idea that Andrew laid out, that what if, what if the administration comes back with a treaty that does, that does allow for this little nose under the tent of the, mm -hmm. of the to, to the, the IT who gets into internet regulation. Yeah. Does, that have, does that have salience in Congress? Do you think that that's something that people would be, that people in Congress would say, no, that's, a that's actually a, a, a bad enough thing for us to reject a tr an international agreement that does that? Yeah. Well, I think people were I mean, shocked by the response on the net neutrality. Well, uh, well, I, I mean, you're, you're you're talking to the guy that worked out the compromise of the, on the rule and testified in support of it in the Congress. Um, um, but um, I, you know, I, I uh, um, you know, I, I I think you know, net neutrality. Just to to take that part of it, I think was was a, was a symbol of this larger transition, and I think that it. Um, you know, I, I was I was there at the unfortunate takeoff of, of uh, uh, on that issue, and I think it was frankly um, a, a, a natural result of, of two industries being thrown together very quickly uh, that had always been separate, um, uh, being thrown together by technology, technological change, um, and um, um, and there being a lot of distrust. Between them, I think there was a there was a there was a fear on the part of the high tech community, and this wasn't that long ago. It was about like 2005 or so. Uh, there was a there was a fear on the part of the high tech community that ISPs uh, would would be and act like gatekeepers, uh, and that would uh, get into the, the the content or website business and and would favor their own stuff uh, over others, or would uh, or would charge uh, um, um, and and uh, Provide uh, favorable treatment, you know, in return for payment, um, and I and I honestly think that it, at our end of it, we were ill-equipped to to deal with that at the time because we, we really we we hadn't fully absorbed what this meant for our business yet. Again, we were still we're still you know getting most of our money from selling voice minutes, not not the internet, and we found ourselves hands, hand, having to answer 
business model questions for future years that we really hadn't confronted yet. Uh, I, think th I think the good thing that came out of the net neutrality debate, and I don't think there were many good things, but, um, uh, and, and I think both, both, uh, all, all sides of it would probably agree uh, that they'd rather not repeat it, but, but one of the good things that came out is it forced these decisions within these companies. I think it forced them earlier than, than they would have occurred otherwise. And I think it, and, and I think, I, I think by and large they've all come out in a good place. You don't, you don't find accusations of ISPs acting as gatekeepers, shutting, cutting people off, cutting off websites, things of this nature. We, we're not in the content business. We don't have content that, that we own that, 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 to favor over somebody else's. You know, we, you know, we've, We've, we've assimilated the notion that, the, again, the more bits we carry, the more money we make, and, and we're pretty agnostic as to what bits they are. We, we weren't there, you know, you know, five or six years ago. That's what's going on, I think, with, with some telecommunications carriers today, and probably with some of the nationally owned carriers that are really worried and petitioning the ITU. Uh, uh, so, to, to, you know, with that, you know, the, your, your question about the, the nose under the tent. I, I do worry about an outcome at the ITU that, that, um, that, that, that sets up an ongoing process that becomes inexorable. Um, that, you know, the, the UN processes don't tend to, de, tend to uh, toward a, a, a radical kind of, you know, you know, step from one paradigm to another. They tend to be more incremental, but, but also inexorable. And, and yes, you have what was described earlier as this, as this vested I interest, uh, you know, uh, the soft, uh, 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 well, I'm not even sure I want to use the term, but, but the, the, the people involved in the IT certainly become invested in the process at a very personal level and, and, and their institutions do as well. And, 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 and so there's always one more meeting and one more step and, and, and you find yourself in that bad place, just, you know, it takes a little longer to get there. And that, so there is a danger of that. Um, yes. Sure, uh, Alex Howard from O'Reilly Media. Um, I happen to be an AT&T customer, have been you. since uh, I think 2008 when I switched over to an iPhone and 3G. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, FaceTime came up as an issue. You mm -hmm. said that you don't produce content, but clearly mm -hmm. as a, uh, one of the biggest providers now of internet mm -hmm. mobile broadband, um, you're moving a lot of bits. So mm -hmm. the, the question for mobile carriers, and this is true across the world, is right. which bits you might favor or not, which services you might favor or not. Mm -hmm. um, now, you have changed the policy around FaceTime. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that as uh, being a principle that you would support around the United States, anywhere else your networks operate, in terms of allowing uh, services that might potentially compete with things that uh, you offer uh, going forward? Well, I mean, first, we, we, do, we don't have a, a FaceTime-like application to favor. Um, secondly, FaceTime has been enabled on our phones in terms of our, on our Wi-Fi for a long time. So if we were worried about it from a competitive standpoint, we'd never have, uh, have done that. Um, you know, it, it's enabled, you know, on our, on our mobile share, you know, um, which, is, which, which is the main plan we're marketing. And, and we recently opened it up. Uh, to to um, you know our our, uh, our tier data customers who have an LTE device, it, it, it's been a gradual implementation, and and it's based on 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 network management concerns. I know some others just did it like that, but 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 the short explanation of what happened is is this: we've got you know probably twice as many iPhones as everybody else put together on our network. Uh, you know, a lot of that, of course, is the result of. Uh, of having the exclusivity with the iPhone for a couple of years and you know but but we continue frankly to sell more than anybody else and, and when Apple implemented its new iOS they put the default to on and so all of a sudden we got FaceTime on an installed base of tens of millions of phones and, and no engineer knows how to model the network usage or something like that and since we have simultaneous voice and data our concern was you know having spent all this money to to pretty much, you know, try to eliminate as much as we could dropped calls. All of a sudden, we were worried about a big spike uh, on that. So we've we've done more of a gradual implementation on it to 
so that we could assess the impact on the network. But, but our commitment, and as we've said publicly, is to, is to fully implement it. Um, you know, we're just we're, you know, we're being a little cautious about how we do it, so we're going to be doing it over a period of months uh, you know, as, as we feel pretty confident about that. It does, it does bring up one other point, though, and that is the, the, the concern about gatekeepers, really. We're sitting there hostage to what, to what the, you know, the, the, the dominant uh, OS providers decide. And they can cause us, you know, millions or billions even in cost simply by what they decide to deploy without even talking to us, uh, you know, through these automatic updates on the phone. If they had, if they had implemented FaceTime with the default to off and the person had to go activate it, we'd have had no concern. With the default to on, you know, the engineers, again, have no way to model it when you got, you know, 30 plus million you know, potential simultaneous users, you know. So, uh, so that's, that's what went on there. Um, uh, you know, thank you for your question. So let's, I'll, I want to bring a question. Um, this will be the last question because we'll try and keep us on schedule. There was a, a point raised by one of the questioners earlier about how much governance we really even need, regardless of who's doing it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder from, from your perspective, is there anything be above and beyond what's being done today in terms of this, you know, the making the domain name system work and so, and the and the and the and that and so on, that really ought to be regulated. Forget about who should be regulating, but that there's a that there's a chaos or that there's a, a lack of rules that is standing in the way of the development of the internet, the development of your business. What what's not being governed that should be governed? I, yeah, honestly, I think the, the the current system works pretty darn well, and it's it's bringing enormous benefits to. To, to billions of people uh, uh, across the globe, not just in this country. And uh, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that anybody who argues to change it or that we need more governance or regulation, whether it's at the ITU or some nation state level, you know, in the current situation, I think bears a heavy burden of demonstrating why. Now we're going to we're going to confront a lot of these questions here in the in this country. You know, as we make our own broadband transition, we have to modernize our own regulations. Everybody understands this because the, the regulations we have in place today are still designed for a monopoly voice-only phone system that doesn't exist anymore. Okay, they're not designed for an IP broadband world and I think, I, I think just as we're resisting the Etno proposals, you know, we need, to, we need to resist similar notions here of just reflexively taking those old style rules designed for 1934 and applying them to a 21st century technology. And I'm not saying that, that this, this has to be a regulation-free zone or something, but I am saying that, that, that we ought to design the regulations for the technology we have today and for the problems that we face today, not simply assume you know, that, that, that things are going to be like they were 70 years ago and apply the same model. Uh, it's, it's the president talks about smart regulation. I think this is the epitome of it. And you know, there's, there, it's it's silly as heck that when you build a modern IP network, you can't turn off the old network. Okay, the regulations bar you from doing that, whether you've got any users on it or not. It makes no sense. And and of course, it it it, it costs you money forever not being able to do that. So so we need to modernize this. And and uh, I think it can be done in a in a tempered way and in a careful way, but, but, but it needs to be done. And, and uh, we need to resist this notion, uh, I think, that's being pushed by, uh, by other carriers in other countries that we should somehow just treat the internet like it's one big telephone system. It's not. Great, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.